My name is Jeffrey William Jackson. In September 2005, you were appointed as a member of the governing body of the Jehovah's Witnesses. That is correct. How are decisions made, by which I mean, uh, are they made only by consensus or, major or by majority, or is there some other system you adopt? Ahead of time, each governing body member, uh, with prayer, by means of prayer and reading the Bible, uh, then tries to see how the Bible would affect any particular decision. Uh, so then, in our discussion, uh, generally from my experience, which has only just been the last uh, 10 years, uh, in most cases, it's unanimous. And if it's not, uh, then it would be carried by majority, is that right? Uh, that is the, the case. So, Matthew 24, verses 45 and 46, and this is how the governing body views their role, what they try to do. Do you, as members of the governing body, regard yourselves as being appointed by Jehovah God or under the capacity or authority of Jehovah God? Uh, what we view ourselves as fellow workers with our brothers and sisters uh, we have been given a responsibility to guard or, or to be guardians of doctrine. Uh, so just the same with elders are referred to as being appointed by Holy Spirit. Uh, as you probably are aware, uh, we believe that means that when an elder is in harmony with what the Bible says is required of an elder, uh, then he is appointed by Holy Spirit. So, where is so the same is true with the governing body. And do you see yourselves as Jehovah God's spokespeople on earth? Uh, that, I think, would seem to be quite presumptuous to, to say that uh, we are the only spokesperson that God is using. Uh, the, clear, the scriptures clearly show uh, that uh, someone can act in harmony with God's Spirit in uh, giving comfort and help in the congregations. From the next sentence, responsible Christian men do their part by setting an example of obedience as they put such arrangements into effect. Are we to understand that the expectation of the governing body is, is that the branches around the world will uh, act in accordance with those procedures and guidelines? Uh, that is the expectation, but may I put the proviso on this? Uh, Mr. Stewart, what you need to understand with regard to our organization is a faith driven organization. Now the governing body realizes that if we were to give some direction that is not in harmony with uh, God's word, uh, all of Jehovah's Witnesses worldwide who have the Bible would notice that and they would see that it was wrong direction. If direction is given based on the Bible, we would expect that they would follow that because of their respect of the Bible. And the definitive interpretation of the Bible from time to time is the governing body. Is that right? Uh, ultimately, as guardians of, of our doctrine and beliefs, uh, yes, uh, some central group needs to make that decision. Now, in, in making decisions on... Uh, the publications, I understand from what you say, is that you're guided by the scriptures. That is correct. And that involves, um, obviously, interpreting the scriptures from time to time. Uh, that is the role of the governing body. And am I right in understanding that the governing body's interpretation of the scriptures on any particular point might change or develop from time to time? Uh, that is correct as well. So I think some examples might be, for example, uh, firstly, the question of uh, 
blood fractions and whether that is or isn't covered by the prohibition for the receipt of blood transfusions. Um, that is correct as well, but if I could just mention, uh, when blood transfusions were first uh, introduced, uh, there wasn't a lot of options with regard to blood fractions. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. Proverbs 13, 24, yes. And the exact quote is, whoever holds back his rod hates his son. What does that mean? Uh, so, Your Honour, you'll notice there's an asterisk there on the term rod, and you see the footnote? Yeah. Uh, discipline or punishment. Uh, so, in the application of this, uh, the, the term rod is used as uh, a symbol or a metaphor to indicate the authority to, uh, to give some punishment. For example, in a modern day setting, uh, my father could say to me, uh, I don't go to the movies because I had uh, broken some of the rules of the home. So it's not about inflicting corporal punishment then? It absolutely is not about inflicting corporal punishment. It would have been when first written, wouldn't it? Uh, how people applied it back then at that time, of course, is, uh, uh, is open to question. Well, what you're telling me, as I understand it, is that your religion, your church, is prepared to interpret the Bible having regard to contemporary social attitudes and standards. Is that right? Uh, obviously, Your Honour, we need to take that into consideration. But the primary responsibility we have is to think, what does Jehovah God mean by this? And uh, we look at other scriptures. Does your church accept corporal punishment of children? Uh, our church accepts uh, the family arrangement and expects that uh, uh, parents have the responsibility to discipline and raise their children. That doesn't answer my question. Do you accept I corporal see. punishment? Uh, in our literature, I think you'll see time and time again, we've endeavoured to explain that here, discipline is referring to more a mental uh, point of view. Um, I, I, regret, I regret punishment. to tell you, you're still not answering my oh, question. Sorry. Do you accept okay. corporal punishment? No. You don't? Mm -hmm. not, not personally, no. And not as an organisation. We don't encourage it. Now, to answer your question directly, uh, women can be involved in this very sensitive area, but biblically speaking, the role of judges in the congregation it lays with men. That's what the Bible says, and that's what we endeavour to follow. Can you give me the reference for that? Uh, yes. Uh, that, in that, the is, that, is, that, that is judges being only men. Not elders, uh, but judges well, being only men. Okay, I would have to check. I think Deuteronomy is one of them, but uh, with regard to First Timothy chapter three, First Timothy chapter three. Uh, in biblical times, uh, the the same expression that is used for elder is also used for older man. And uh, when we're translating, of course, that is my field. Sometimes it is hard to to decide whether it means elder as in a position or older man. But definitely when it speaks of judges at the gates in Israel, uh, we're talking about older men. But I apologize, Your Honor, seeing uh, uh, you asked this question, I cannot give you the exact scriptural reference, but we'll be happy well, to do I, that. We would appreciate it. Can you understand the, the circumstance for a woman who brings an allegation against an elder? who is a friend of the others who must judge 
the truth or otherwise of the allegation. Can you understand how that person must feel? I, I can try to understand it, Your Honour, yes. Uh, but again, could I ask, and again, this is not my field of activity, uh, but as, as far as I understand, uh, we have a, a, a process in place whereby a neutral member, uh, like a circuit overseer, will be involved with uh, such a sensitive case. It would be the case, would it not, that even a circuit overseer is going to know an elder well? Uh, they, they should be familiar, but they also know the victim well. Well, you, and, I don't know whether you've heard the evidence also, of the survivors here. Did you hear that evidence? No, unfortunately, that was a bad time for me caring for my father. I'm, I apologise. But I will look forward to hearing a, a summary of it. But you'll accept, I'm sure, that in many instances where a woman or young woman makes such an allegation, she would feel a lot more comfortable having to make the allegation and explain the circumstances to another woman. Uh, I can't say that I would give a comment on that, uh, Mr. Stewart, because, uh, you see, again, it takes away the consideration of the relationships in our congregations. It's not like your churches where people just go to church and don't uh, talk to one another. Uh, their congregations do become familiar and there, there can be a friendship. So I, I agree that the point you're trying to get at, we need to know what the victim is comfortable in doing with regard to who they speak to. I was wondering whether you could have a structure which meant that the judicial decision as to whether or not um, the allegation was true could be determined by a body capable of having women represented on it. And that body's decision would then be taken to the elders in relation to decisions to disfellowship. Do you understand? I understand that, Your Honour. Well, is it possible, and, uh, is it, is uh, it possible uh, to make that change? It is possible to make sure that elders are fully aware of the whole story. But for women to be elders in the congregation, that is not possible. No, Mr Jackson, I wasn't asking you that. I was asking you, okay, to, consider, I was asking you to consider whether the process may involve a determination which we outside the church would call a judicial determination, that is, is the allegation true or false? And then that decision having been made, the elders would then make a decision as to the consequence, being disfellowship or otherwise. Do you understand? I do understand. Could women be involved in the determination of whether or not the allegation is true? Uh, well, Your Honour, if I could say, I think they already are involved. Not in the, in the, decision, the, not in the decision, Mr Jackson. Please address my question. Okay, uh, but uh, yes, in, in, well, please, could I just use an example? If an underage child uh, it says that something has happened and then two women are involved with helping that person, surely they have to decide whether or not the facts are true they, and present those to the elders. Mr. Otherwise, Mr. how would the elders know Mr. what the Jackson, facts are? Mr. Jackson, you're not dealing with my question. I'm sorry, would you I like apologise. Would you like me to put it again? Would you like me to put it again? If you would, please. Your process at the moment <coughs> has a judicial determination which is made by the elders. And that's the point at which a decision is made as to whether the allegation is true or false. Do you understand that? Mm hmm. You do? I do understand that, Your Honour. Is it possible for the process to be modified? so that that decision can be made by a body which could include women, that is, the decision as to whether or not the allegation is true or false, made by a body which could include women, and that decision would thereafter be uh, uh, acted upon uh, and a decision made as to whether or not to disfellowship by the elders. Do you understand? I do understand, and I apologise, Your Honour, for not uh, answering directly. I didn't understand fully what you were saying. Uh, the, the answer, Your Honour, is uh, such a, a, a situation would be worthy of us considering and 
doing research and checking the scriptures. Uh, yes, the, the possibility of considering that is there. One of the things that's emerged in the last couple of weeks, that in Australia at least, I, amongst the Jehovah's, or in the Jehovah's Witness organization, there's a practice of not reporting child sexual abuse allegations to the authorities unless required by law to do so. Do you accept that? Uh, I'm not familiar with the statistics or the general practice, but I can tell you uh, why there is a spiritual dilemma uh, because of this uh, question. Well, that, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm driving at. Uh, so perhaps you can address that question specifically, which is this. Is there a scriptural basis to that policy being or practice being not to report child sexual abuse allegations to the authorities unless required by law to do so? So Proverbs 25, verses 8 through 10. First Peter, First Peter, and uh, the fifth chapter, and verses two and three. Another aspect that an elder needs to consider is he does not have the authority to lord it over or take over control of a family arrangement where a person who, let's say, it's a, a victim who is 24, 25 years of age, has a right to decide whether or not they will report that incident. Let's take the situation in a family where <clears throat> one of the children, let's say the eldest, uh, reports having been abused uh, by her father. Yes, if that report is um, accepted as having uh, validity, you would accept that the potential is, is that the other children in the family remain at risk. Uh, that is correct. And by not reporting to the authorities, is the case not that the confidentiality of the one who reported is regarded as being more important than to protect those who are still at risk? Uh, no, uh, Mr. Stewart, if I could just, what I'm trying to highlight is there are several factors that make it hard for a minister of religion uh, to make a clear cut or quick decision on this matter. Uh, obviously, I think again what has been highlighted to the Commission, uh, the elders should encourage the, the guardian of the child or whoever is in that family arrangement that is not the perpetrator to notify the authorities. Now, turning to another aspect that we've dealt with, which is the question of the two witness rule, you'll be aware that if there's no confession, then two witnesses to serious wrongdoing uh, are required, or to two similar events of serious wrongdoing, in order that there is sufficient evidence to establish a judicial committee. Do you understand that? I do understand that. If I could take you to the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 18. Matthew 18. Yes, and here are the words of our Lord. Uh, verse 16, that's correct. Uh, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. But in, in, this is talking in the sense of a judicial setting. Uh, and if he does not listen, take along with you one or two more, so that on the testimony of two or three witnesses, every matter may be established. The reality is if there's only one witness in the case of child sexual abuse, then uh, it cannot be taken further by the elders. And as it's put in the literature, it's left in the hands of Jehovah. Well, I want to take you back then to the scriptural basis for that. So you've referred to Matthew 18, verse 16. And as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, that that in turn really is a reference back to Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. In other words, what uh, Jesus Christ was doing is referring back to that aspect of Mosaic law, dealing with uh, evidence. Uh, he did quote, as he often did, from the Mosaic law. 
but he gave it Christian application. So, but that is an element to be found in the Mosaic law as set out in Deuteronomy 19.15, is that right? It is an element that is found in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. You'll be familiar, and perhaps we can, we can go to, to Deuteronomy 22, uh, 23 to 27. If, however, the man happened to meet the engaged girl in the field, and the man overpowered her and lay down with her, and the man who lay down with her, sorry, the man who lay down with her is to die by himself, and you must do nothing to the girl. The girl has not committed a sin deserving of death. This case is the same as when a man attacks his fellow man and murders him, for he happened to meet her in the field, and the engaged girl screamed, but there was no one to rescue her. So the point of this uh, last example is that uh, there's no second witness, is there? Because the woman's in the field, she screamed, but there was no one to rescue her. Do you accept that? Uh, could I explain, uh, Mr. Stewart, that, you see, I think already under testimony, uh, some of Jehovah's Witnesses have explained that the two witness, uh, witnesses uh, needed can be, in some cases, the circumstances. Uh, I think, was well, it a, I'll come uh, to an that. example given? I'll come to that, Mr. Jackson. Okay, so we'll get through this a lot quicker and easier if we just address it one step at a time. So, okay. the, the present step. So, the answer to your question. The present step is Sorry. this: is that in that example, you accept it's a case where uh, the uh, there was no other witness beyond the woman herself. Uh, there was no other witness except the woman herself, but added to that were the circumstances. Yes, well, the circumstances were that she was raped in the field. Mm -hmm. and, yes, but they were circumstances. And it was sufficient, there being only one witness, it was nevertheless sufficient for the conclusion that the man should be stoned to death. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Now, is it... I think we're agreeing on the point. Yes, is it not the case that had Jesus been asked about a case of sexual abuse, he may have referred back to this part of Deuteronomy and said that it's not required to have two witnesses. Um, I certainly would like to ask Jesus that, and I, I can't at the moment. I hope to in the future. Uh, but uh, uh, that's a hypothetical question, which we, if we had an answer, then we could support what you said. Well, it's hypothetical in a sense, but really what I'm, I'm driving at is is the scriptural basis, and, and you the scholar, I'm not, uh, is the scriptural basis to the two witness rule uh, really so solid, or is there not space for your governing body to recognize that in cases of sexual abuse uh, it need not apply? Uh, again, if I could just mention the fact that, uh, that we've already acknowledged that circumstances can also be one of the witnesses. Well, I'll, I'll come to that, but my, my, my question is a different one. It's whether the scriptural basis to, a to the two-witness rule in relation to cases of sexual abuse has a proper foundation. Uh, we believe it does because of the number of times that that principle is emphasized in the scriptures. And so, for example, if they had become inactive or sought to fade without formally dissociating, uh, and the elders came to visit and found them celebrating Christmas or a birthday, they would be found to be in transgression of the rules, would they not? Uh, that is not my understanding. Uh, uh, but again, as I said, it's not my field. Uh, that goes into policy with regard to uh, uh, those type of things. Uh, but from my personal experience, that's not the case. Well, Mr. Nisson, you say it's not your field, but you're a member of the governing body, which is responsible, as you've said, for the whole field, and you've been a member for 10 years, and all the committees are, are responsible to and accountable to the governing body. So if someone hasn't disassociated but has sought merely to, to become inactive or to fade, they're then still subject to the organization's discipline and rules. Uh, if they acknowledge being one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And if they 
do the contrary, which is to say they're not one of Jehovah's Witnesses, the effect of that is disassociation. Uh, that's if they decide to go down that course. It's right, isn't it, that in the case of both disassociation and disfellowshipping, the remaining members of the Jehovah's Witnesses cannot associate with the disassociated or disfellowship person. Yes, that's according to the Bible principles, which I'm sure you've already read. And that it's even <coughs> family members not living in the same household. Freedom from the organization on the one hand and friends, family and social network on the other. Uh, I thought I made it quite clear that I don't agree with that uh, supposition. Well, I think uh, you see, are we talking about a gross sin that's been committed or someone who just wants to leave Jehovah's Witnesses? Let me, me, let me clarify it. If someone no longer wants to be an active Jehovah's Witness and they're not uh, in the community viewed as a Jehovah's Witness, we do not have a so-called spiritual police force to go in and handle that. You're disagreeing on the example of what they do wrong. And that's not my point. My point is they may do nothing wrong, but they're still subject to the rules of the organization in the event that at some point they do do something wrong. I will agree with that, yes. but I don't so, agree with the sweeping statement. They only have the two choices. Well, that was the point I was disagreeing with. Well, it's right then, isn't it? Because if they don't want to be subject to the discipline and rules of the organization, then they have to leave by actively dissociating. Isn't that the truth? Uh, that's if they definitely don't want to be, yes. But there are some that uh, do not want to make that active move. Well, the result then is, is they're faced with the choice between the freedom, of the freedom from the organization on the one hand and having to leave the, lose their family and friends and social network on the other. Uh, that's how you would like to put it, Mr. Stewart, but I thought I'm trying to say that there are those, some of whom I have heard of, that uh, just fade away and uh, they're, they're not actively Jehovah's Witnesses. You've put it that they have a choice uh, to leave or not to leave. For someone who wants to leave, perhaps because they've suffered abuse by someone in the organization and don't feel that it's been treated properly or adequately, it's a very difficult choice, isn't it? Because they must choose. I agree with that. And it can yes. be... It can be a very cruel choice for them, not so. I agree, it's a difficult choice. And it can be personally devastating because they can lose their whole social network and their families. Uh, that can be the case, yes. Would you accept then that putting people to that choice through this system of disassociating from them or shunning as it's sometimes referred to is contrary to the Jehovah's Witness belief and freedom of religious choice? Uh, no, I don't accept that. Uh, I think you're jumping to a conclusion there, but I understand that you have that opinion. Is uh, indication that they likewise still believe that it's a good lifestyle? Mr. So Jack, you were baptized at age 13, am I right? I certainly was, yes. And there are, in fact, many Jehovah's Witnesses who are baptized at an age even younger than that? Uh, there have been some I have met that have been baptized younger. And do you consider that at that age, someone is old enough and mature enough to make a decision affecting the rest of their lives? Uh, yes, I do in some cases. Obviously, uh, there are uh, some children that uh, wouldn't be able to make that decision. And perhaps some would have questioned whether I could make that decision at 13 years of age. But I've worked with people that have been baptized when they were 11, and they have stuck by that determination their whole life. Well, that may be because they can't leave the organization without leave, leaving behind everyone whom they know. Uh, anything is possible. Mm. And do you accept that putting people to that choice <clears throat> makes your organization, in many respects, a captive organization? I do not accept that at all. Is there a scriptural basis to this policy of shunning? Yes. Thank you very much for the opportunity to express it. Uh, 1 Corinthians is the scripture, and no doubt you've seen it already. But um, Sorry, Mr. Jackson, I, I'm really just asking, is there a scriptural basis, and you've identified what it is, because my next oh, question is, okay. is can it 
can it change? In other words, is there a basis upon which you foresee that your organization might be able to change that policy? Uh, no. Now, do you recognize, Mr. Jackson, and in asking this question, let me make it clear, I'm not suggesting it's peculiar to the Jehovah's Witness organization. There are many, many organizations in this position. But do you accept that the Jehovah's Witness organization has a problem with child abuse amongst its members? I accept that child abuse is a problem right throughout the community, and it's something that we've had to deal with as well. And do you accept that it's presented, I withdraw that, do you accept that the manner in which your organization has dealt with allegations of child sexual abuse uh, has also presented problems? Uh, there have been, we've changed the policy, would indicate that the original policies weren't perfect. And you accept, of course, that your organization, including people in positions of responsibility like elders are not immune from the problem of child sexual abuse. Uh, that appears to be the case. And that such efforts are not necessarily an attack on your organization or its system of beliefs? Uh, we understand that too. You described earlier in your testimony that the work of the this Royal Commission is beneficial. Do you accept then that the Royal Commission's efforts are genuine and well-intentioned? I certainly do. And would you disagree then with anyone who said that the efforts to highlight and deal with child sexual abuse in the Jehovah's Witness Church uh, is engaging in apostate lies? Another way we can contribute to the oneness, rejecting false stories that are designed to separate us from Jehovah's organization. As an example, think about the apostate-driven lies and dishonesties that Jehovah's organization is permissive toward pedophiles. I mean, that is ridiculous, isn't it? If anybody takes action against someone who would threaten our young ones and takes action to protect our young ones, it's Jehovah's organization. We reject outright such lies. Uh, I guess that's a, a broad question because sometimes those who make these accusations make many other accusations as well. Uh, but let me assure you, uh, the person making the accusation is not the main thing. The main thing is, is there some basis to the accusation? Mr. Jackson, has the governing body considered uh, apologizing to survivors of child sexual abuse at the hands of uh, elders within the organization? Uh, I haven't been in any discussions with regard to that. Is that something that you foresee might happen? In other words, that it, uh, an apology at least be considered? Uh, the governing body has apologized on other matters, so uh, for me to say uh, I can't speak collectively for everybody, but uh, we have apologized on things in the past in other areas, so it is perceivable.